<laughs> Welcome back to session 16 of 120C, 220C. Today we will continue our exploration of search strategies. Um, finally getting to kind of look at something interesting that we can do with a while loop that isn't so easy to sort of accomplish with an exhaustive list map, as well as diving into sort of how these genetic algorithms fit in. And then we're going to head on towards another type of analysis. We did a little bit of solar insulation analysis, which is like one classic way of evaluating a building form. Another way is actually to start thinking about its energy performance. So just either its EUI or oh, the energy consumption or the uh, fuel consumption. There's any number of things that um, all those different values that you typically pull out of the DOE 2.2 energy analysis can be reported on and pulled back and being used as a way to evaluate like how good different forms are. And we'll look at that one. We're also going to look at daylighting analysis. It's another way to do that. We'll do that today. We're going to be heading into that next week. But where this is all heading, um, as we kind of, kind of push towards wrapping up the end of the quarter here, is really just looking at all these different ways you could evaluate different building forms and think about like you know whether they're desirable or not and try to choose really what the best building form is. And that's going to start to get into what we're going to do for our final project in here. Okay, so we'll distribute it on Tuesday. It's going to be a very bounded thing. What we're actually going to do is go through and do a little uh, kind of thinking about potential building forms for a specific site. Okay, and almost have a little competition. Okay, with everyone sort of working on the same basic site and proposing different building forms, but evaluating it along a number of different dimensions. So there'll be, you'll be given sort of a basic program that says here's the site, and that site has some setbacks and some height limitations and things that you have to work within. But within that, we'll propose some different criteria to look at. You know, you have a certain amount of square footage you have to create, and based upon sort of where that square footage is, how high it is in the building, you'll have kind of a sliding rate for how valuable that is in terms of how we might be able to rent that out. Um, we'll have different costs associated with square footage at different levels of the building to kind of trade off a little bit about the value you're creating versus the cost of creating it. But you'll also go through and look at, you know, trying to evaluate and propose different building forms and think about, you know, do you really want kind of a tall single tower? Would you like several towers on the site? Which should be a longer, flatter building? And looking at that in terms of different shapes, evaluating it for energy, evaluating it for daylighting, evaluating it for you know, any of these criteria that might trade off. And what we're going to get to is that we're ultimately going to come to different sort of solutions that will all value in different ways and kind of put them all up there and just kind of look at each proposal. You're going to find that when we're doing optimization, you know, there's never a single right answer unless you have a single criteria. As soon as you have multiple criteria, like several different things can happen in terms of like uh, driving it and things will be equally attractive for different reasons. So we'll kind of lobby for why we think our solution is best. Okay, but we kind of bounded. We'll have a week to work on it, and then on our final session, we'll put up all the different solutions and kind of look at them and talk about how you compare and contrast all those things. Okay, so that's what's happening. That'll happen next week. Okay, so what's going on now? Okay, where we are going today is as follows. We went ahead the last time, and we spent a lot of time in our list mapping, looking how we could list map to go ahead and flex this tower with a single value, to kind of flex it with a pair of values. Where we want to head off to is the ever popular while loop, and kind of apply the same sort of technology there. But I wanted to go back and we'll visit a 16.1, one very specific piece of kind of the example, and that was this notion of we actually created a pretty good general purpose node in there at towards the end of the class where we went through and created something where we could plug in different sorts of test values or pairs of test values and those could change and we could kind of swap out different reporting values we wanted to pull back out, but overall there's a basic structure of a kind of simple node that's very repurposable and that's what I want to start with is looking at that because we'll use that to kind of make the while loop example a little bit better. So to get ourselves going, actually, we're going to head into 16.2, but open up 16.1 for just a minute. And if you do, you should end up with a loop that looks like this somewhere in here. Let me go ahead and close this up. I'll open it up from the start. Which demo file? OK. We're going to go ahead and, oh, where do we want to go? Let me kind of think about this myself. Go back out here, session 16. We'll go towards the end.
Well, actually, no, let's do this. We'll go to the one that we actually did there. Do I have that in there? Pairs of inputs. Go to 3B. Oh, it's not going to find it for me. Where is that? Da, 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 da. Hmm. Try that again. 16.1. Unknown error. Well, I'll just open it. Can you open it on your side? Yeah. Yes. Great. Let me just open 3x, see if that's any better. Still not. Okay, what's going on? There's something strange going on here. <laughs> Well, when that doesn't look good, I'm going to say, let's just restart Revit. <laughs> it seems to be there. Come back in there again. See if I can open up anything or if just uh, my computer's confused right now, which happens. I'll do, oh, let me do the twisting tower for right now. <coughs> It won't matter right now. We're just really going to look at the node. We're not going to really run anything out of here. So here we have, oh, this is like kind of that twisting triangular tower. Kind of an interesting shape here. This is one where I haven't bounded the middle to make it taper evenly. So the upper, the lower, and the middle can be skinny or fat if it needs to. Okay, just sort of a different shape for this. But let's go ahead and see if I can get that Dynamo file open. Okay, opening up again. Let's try. To the time we did it. The basic idea here was that we were going to go through and prior I just had a formula that said compute surface area and volume. Okay, and then compute surface area and volume from pairs. We went ahead and put together something like that. But there turns out there's actually a more general way of doing this, and that's what I want to sort of really dwell on in terms of opening this up, is really just kind of thinking about that function because this function over here, we always pass in the element, the thing we want to change pass in some input value list, and whether that input value list is a pair of values or a single value, kind of depends on what we want to feed it. There's sort of this notion here of a test parameter, the name of what we're going to test, that's going to set the value to that, saying that, and then we're also going to report some things. And in this older function, I reported an explicitly output specific things. It was very kind of locked in. So I just want to draw your attention here, if you go ahead and open, your attention to updated report values. So element updated report values is actually kind of a nice generalizable function that you can really use for a whole lot of things. So let's just kind of take a look at that because we might use that a little bit later today. In this function, it basically just has a couple of different inputs to it. It has the idea of the element that you're going to bring in, okay? And we're going to do some transaction setting based on that. We have some different test parameters. Those are the things we're going to try testing. We're going to set those things. So they have the sets and we go to the transaction end. We have the reporting parameters over here. These are the things that we want to get the values of. So they're all popping around down there. Okay. What this function does is it's actually going ahead and allowing us to read in pairs of values. So it's taking the pairs and breaking them into the first and the second of the pair using the first of the pair to set the parameter, using the second of the pair to set the other parameter. So this is where we left off last time. But it's kind of a good general purpose function. You know, we could adapt that if we only wanted to sort of bring in a single value. You know, we've got a lot of different things in here, but for the most part, this is actually a pretty good function. And at the tail end of it, I've abstracted a little bit to say, let's go ahead and build the output data structure where what we're doing is I'm grabbing the first input value, the second input value, and kind of making a list out of those. 
and then getting the different output values and kind of putting them all together in a list. So this is for every pair that we feed in, it's going to report the pair values, and it's going to report, actually, this has four different things, the three reporting parameters, and it actually has one ratio between the pair reporting parameters. Okay, so very generalizable function. Okay, so hang on to this, keep it filed away in your examples of kind of good things to big borrow and adapt. Okay, because you'll probably end up being able to use something like this a little bit later. That's just kind of your general purpose format. And I like the idea of being able to abstract things like this so you're not creating special purpose functions for every different kind of pair of things that you want to go through and test. This is kind of yeah, pretty generalizable. So let's just leave that there because we might use that a little bit later. <coughs> but what we're going to do is shift our attention to the while loop example. Let's just kind of talk about what's going on with the while loop. The well loop really starts with setting up some sort of custom testing node. So whether we're list mapping or we're well looping, the same sort of thing. We're going to put in some input value, we're going to pop out some output values. The key thing here that's a little bit different is we're going to step until the condition is true as opposed to exhaustively going through the entire list. So we're going to need a slightly different structure here because as opposed to just marching through and reporting march, report, march, report, march, report, we're going to go through every step and we're going to report and say, OK, let's stop and look at that value for just a second. And if it's already outside the bounds of what's uh, viable, we'll stop. We won't keep on going any further. So it's a little kind of stop, and we have to put a little if condition after every kind of segment of the loop. OK, finally, what I'm doing in this example is I'm setting the element of the target value. So what's happening is after the loop, and we keep on looping while the condition is true, the problem you'll find out with a while loop is it keeps on going until it fails. So what we have to do is basically say, hey, oops, one too many. Let's back off one, OK, and then set the element to that target value. OK, so that's the basic structure here. Let's just go through and take a look at it in 16.2. So we'll come back over here, go to 16.2. Let's just start with setting up that custom node. And for this one, let's even go ahead and I'll start with 1A. So in this one, I put this one together before we had this kind of custom general purpose node. In this case, I have a single test parameter, a value, a result parameter, and a place where I'm actually going to write the results, okay? as well as a uh, less than or equal to. So how this is basically going to work is we're going to take some simple little box. Oops. Actually, before I do that, let me open up the example for one, eh? as opposed to just uh, the Dynamo script. Actually, it would work for this. But what I like to do is, again, I'm just going to start with something really simple. We'll extend it to that just a little bit. I'm going to start with my little, oh, my looping till the target value met set little box. Again, why do I start with a box? It's because when the box doesn't do what I expect it to do, I can spot it, and I know that it's getting the wrong values. Yeah, we'll apply the same technology to a more interesting shape in just a second. So I just got my little box here. Okay, and again, my little box over here has, oh, I made him 10 by 10, okay, with a height of 22 right now. The reason I like 10 by 10 is because it's really easy for me to say based on the height, I can figure out what the volume is really quickly and test my node that way. Okay, so within there, let's go back and open up that Dynamo script. Again, I had to sort of close the Dynamo script, open the Revit project file, then reopen the Dynamo script within here. And the reason is the Dynamo script thinks it's always related to whatever the Revit project or family is that you opened it from. It thinks it was being the host of it. Okay, so if you go swapping Revit project files out underneath it, it gets a little bit confused and you have to kind of point it back in the right direction. Okay, so I got my little element. We'll go through and choose that. The idea is I'm going to flex the height of this thing. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to keep track of the gross volume. And I'm going to have a target value for what the gross volume is. And what I want to do is kind of keep on evaluating until I get to be, you know, basically any greater than that. I want to get the maximum volume that I can. So 
even though 1600 it might be able to get evenly. If it got to 1590, I'd be happy. I just don't want to be 1610. Okay, something like that. So let's kind of put that all together. We'll say, hey, let's come back over here. Do my little change. I'll get that guy over here. Super, that's going to be the element. It's going to come on in over here. In terms of the test parameter, that's what I think of as the test parameter name. I'll put that in over here. In terms of the test value, that's kind of an interesting one because I want to go through and put in some test values. I have this whole notion of basically some value. For example, I could put in the value 10 right now. That's going to be the initial value, although I'm going to do something a little bit different in just a second. The result parameter is going to be gross volume. <coughs> And ultimately, it's going to return the value of whatever the gross volume is. But we're going to do something a little bit different as we set this up. Let's just kind of take a look inside that node, just to kind of take a look at what's going on in there. We'll open that up. It's my little evaluator node. As we keep on going today, you're going to call, I'm going to call it an evaluator node. At some point, I may call it a fitness function, because when we get to the genetic algorithms, they look at it that way. They say, you're going to evaluate the fitness of a solution. So it's really just another name for it. But it's always just transaction, start, set the parameter, end for the single value, and then get. And then from that get, we can go through and create some sort of result parameter value. Now, we can just go ahead and report the single result parameter value, but I'm going to do something a little more exotic here. What I'm going to do is actually go through and start writing a data file. Let me explain why. Because when you use the while loop and you go zipping along, as opposed to the list map where you get all the intermediate values along the way, the while loop just keeps on going and only reports the final value. Okay, so in this node we did something a little bit sneaky. Every time we go through and compute a value, we actually write it out to a little CSV file. We write it out to a text file so I can kind of keep track of what's going along. Okay, so what's going to happen every time here, what I'm going to do is basically add a row to the CSV file. I'm going to have some CSV file. We're going to give a name out there and kind of point to it. And every time we have a new result, what we're going to do is just basically add it <coughs> to the file path. Okay, so. This CSV file is going to get more and more rows every time we run it. And again, that's just my way of snooping on it. Okay, what's going to happen down here is I'm going to add a data row, I'm going to write out the file. So I'm going to read in the file, add a data row, write it out. So I can either get individual values or basically snoop. And if you want to see what's happening in my snooping node, down in there, you can edit that custom node. You see, all it's doing is it's taking the CSV file, it's getting the file and reading it, and it's taking the new row to add to it and joining it. So it's just putting it at the tail end. So I'm joining the old data, the new data, and just putting it out as data. So it's just always appending that data to the tail end. Okay. So not too awfully bad, but let's kind of put it into practice and see how it all works. So I have something that looks pretty good here in terms of function. You'll notice, though, I'm not using a list map. If I used a list map, that would actually work. In fact, if I went through and put a list map over here and I fed in a range of values, you know, that would work amazingly similar to what we're used to. In fact, let's just do that, just to sort of test it. <laughs> Let me come over here. I'm going to say, let's do the results file path. In, oh, just somewhere on my desktop. I'm just going to put something in there. It's going to be called example162.csv. Actually, I take the fact, .txt. Save that away. That'll be my result file. OK, for my test value, how about this? If I'm going to use this the traditional list map way, what I would do is say list.map. Okay, for the list of height values, let me go ahead and start with 10. I'm going to say my start value 
up to my end value. Using my increment value. So that's going to create the list. So I'm going to take that start value, which is currently set to 10. For my end value, I don't really have an end value. Yeah, so I'm going to just go through and put in there, oh, let's make it up to, say, 30. My increment value is I'm going to increment it by 2. Okay, so should go 10 to 30 by 2. If we're playing this right, this should say 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. Go through and feed that as a list. Put them in here as our test values and figure out what's happening at the back end. So I'm going to take this out over here and just list map it. So this is the way we have been doing it. So a little list map in <coughs> action, start to end, increment, feed it as a list, feed it into our function, see if we're actually sort of getting things up. So, so far makes sense? That should look sort of familiar. Let me even in here just because I want to put a nice little watch over here somewhere. You can see what's going on with my list map nicely. Even I'll go through and put a watch on the uh, input values just to make sure that we're really getting those right. When these things get complicated, I like to have a lot of watches just to be sure because you're never quite sure where it breaks down. So a little bit of a public exposure is a good thing to really make sure that we're getting the behavior we want. Okay, so I'll try running that. Just sort of see what that looks like. Okay. That kind of looks like it did what it was supposed to. What I'm doing is I just took that box and I changed its height from 10 to 20 or to 30. You'll see as it's moving on up there, oh, what would we expect? If it was 10 high and it was 10 by 10, I think it would be 1,000. If it was 30, it would be somewhere around 3,000, something like that. So let's sort of see what's going on. Looks like we have some values up here going 10 to 30. That's looking about right. Yeah, so this is a little strange in terms of that rounding error. Yeah, 999.9999. Okay, so that's a little annoying. I suppose we have a round function here. We could probably round it off. But that's actually, it's kind of looking like it's supposed to be doing what it's supposed to be doing. The deal is, though, if really what I wanted was 2,000, everything past iteration 5 was really not necessary because you know, I didn't need to go through and do all that. So we want to go through and use this very same sort of function, but use it in a different way. As opposed to list mapping this way, we want to leave a little while loop to kind of stop it when it gets to 2,000. Okay, and that's the point of all of this. Now, let's just sort of see if my little uh, snooping text file is doing what it's supposed to do. I can never be quite certain, but let's go out and see if we can find it. See what's happening. It looks like it's right there. No, nope, that's not it. Hang on. Desktop. There it is. Still looks like it says zero in there. That's not very good looking in terms of having any results. So let's open that up. I got nothing either. So let's see if we can figure out why we got nothing. Nothing's not a good result. So let's open up this function. That's why we debug these things. Okay. Looks like I got something over here in terms of some values. That was actually going in there. I'm trying to add it to the CSV file. So let's just sort of see what's going on, if I can watch and figure this out. You'll notice down here it says null. That's never a good <coughs> sign. So I suspect that whatever's supposed to be happening here and writing out, it's trying to write null. So I bet you my function's having troubles down here. So let's kind of do a little snooping down in there to see if we can figure it out. Actually, even if we want to be really cautious about this, let's put some more watches in. You'll find I'm a like, watch fiend in terms of trying to debug these things. So I'll put a watch on. Let's just make sure that the CSV file really is coming through in the way we think it is. OK, then in this little function, this little function, it seems to have, as we feed into a data row to add, that actually looks pretty good. We have some values there. So let's see what's going on down in that other thing. 
Head at you. Let's take a look. CSV file from path. That should be okay. Let's just put some watches in here. Ah, looks like even read from file. That is null. So let's see what's going on. Something doesn't seem to be right here. Well, is it because you don't have anything in the initial? I don't suspect it'll be that, but you know, you never know. <coughs> because the, the data that's being imported into the CSV header file is coming in. It's coming through. The data that's supposed to be coming in there should be, yeah. That yeah, looks but like when you add a null, when you add that data to the null, yeah. it's, it outputs null, I think. Okay, so let's check this out. I'm going to run it again with all these watches exposed. Okay, so the data list to add, that we think is going to come through okay. Yep. Let's see what's happening where it's breaking down in there. Okay, and if you're right, let's just go try putting something in there. Because, hey, I'm not about putting a header in there. What the hell? Okay, I didn't say that on camera. <laughs> okay, let's come back over here. Again, we'll just rerun that. Okay, let's go back over here and see what's happening. So it looks like, interesting, okay, it looks like it's reading it, it looks like it's going out here, it's doing whatever it's supposed to be doing over there, it's still doing that null over there. Hmm, how very strange. You'd like to think it'd be there. File object to read from. Looks like it's doing it okay. Dot txt. I would think that'd be okay. Let's try your theory in terms of, I'm gonna try two different things. I'm gonna try putting some data in there. I'm also gonna try just changing the name to a CSV and see if that helps it at all. But you know, hey, clearly we're breaking down somewhere where we think it should work. Okay, come over here, export this, edit, edit, edit. Okay, let's go ahead and put in there some sample data. I'll say one sample data two, just something like that. Actually, I'm gonna be really simple about it and even go through and make it single words because I've had some troubles with that in the past as you know, with those extra spaces in there. Let's try that. I will save that one away. Okay, let's go ahead and try running that. Coming back over. Back over here. A little more flashing, so that sort of sounded better, or looked better. Well, check that out. That's kind of annoying that it has to have a little uh, header data in there in terms of what's going on, but if that's what it's going to take. That's what it's going to take. So, did you edit that for me? So, well, all I did was I took that. We're going to try the CSV approach too, but it didn't like the blank text file. So, what we ended up doing was we went over to our text file and just gave it a little bit of a header. And our header was pretty simple. It was just, we put um, just that little bit of a header row in there. When we tried to read the data file, the data file was empty. It just didn't really like that. Okay, so. Are those periods, not commas? Those are commas. These are periods over here. Yeah, why are they separated by period? Oh, that is because this is just the rounding error. The nine, there's oh, really only. Oh, that's a nine. Oh, okay. yeah. That's just Those that. are commas, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. I see. Okay. So we could probably do that within the within the initial Dynamo script, right? Just add headers. That would actually be a great way to do it. So even before we could do it that way, I'm going to tell you, there ought to be a way to sort of, sort of say that we're going to kill the null if it's null to do that, but let's go through, I think you're on to sort of an interesting approach, because I think that would actually be the best way to kind of kill it off nicely. So let us go ahead, and for this ZSV file, let's go through, <laughs> and before we even come on over here, watch it, now it's interesting, da, 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 start and result file path, yada, yada, yada. I'm thinking about how to do it so that it doesn't race ahead. I want to do something to the file, but I don't want to go through and have it evaluate before it actually happens to the file. Does that make sense? It's kind of a strange thing. So we can try that over here. Your, your approach, I think, is actually pretty good. We could go through and say that we're going to basically put a string in and just write it to that file. 
just trying to think about the best way to do that because I don't want that to kind of, I don't want to create a hole out of all that. Hang on. Because it's going to write it the first time. Hang on. Is there an if null in here somewhere? Let's check this out. Remove nulls, replace nulls, is null. If the given object is null, list replaces a null value with a given list as a substitute. I kind of like that one. Or is that just replaces all null values in a list? And that would be close, but no banana. Remove null is null. I kind of like that one, because that'll sort of be true or false. Although, we'll see if it actually sort of works. Let's just test this in here. What I would basically do is say that if it is null, okay, that's basically a Boolean. <coughs> then we're going to go through and do something else. So that would have an if associated with it. Where'd my if go? So if you are null, well, let's try this. If you aren't null, I'm going to basically pass that one through. That's the list to join. If you are null, let's just go ahead and put a little, I'm just going to put some junk in there right now, just so we're not writing out. I can make that much better looking in a second. I just want to test this to sort of see if my if will work. Is there the logic of what I'm trying to do here? So if it's null, go ahead and put a header row. Otherwise, just sort of pass the data on through. So let us just try that as a starting point. We're willing to experiment. Okay, now to test this, what I'm going to do is come back over here. And I'm going to write it out to a new file, a fresh clean file that it hasn't had anything yet. I'll say 123b.txt. Okay, let's just run this. Looking pretty good. Let's come back over here. Actually, that actually sort of that worked too. Okay, not exactly a great way to do it, but actually that's sort of an okay way. Inserting the header row, I don't mind that in terms of the nice thing about this. This is going to guarantee that I didn't write it out in advance and I might race ahead. So if ever it encounters the null, it's going to go through and put the header row in there. Okay, so what I need to do now is just sort of pass in a better hook of header row. Okay, so. I'll live with this one as a way to do it. We've kind of cleaned up this DOIF file. Would anyone like this DOIF file, like this uh, CSV add data rows, you can throw it into your example, or do you feel pretty good about sort of where you are and what you have on your machine? Okay? Okay? Great, okay? Okay, then let's, I'm here. Okay, so if anyone needs it, just holler. Otherwise, just give them the data file. Just go through and put like a, just something in the front row just so it's not null. Okay, enough of all that. Let's go back over here. So here's the deal. We have got our fabulous test function over here. We've got this sort of uh, notion that it's doing too many. We want to do a little less than or greater than sort of test to see if we'll keep on going. So our while wow loop is the way to do this. And let's go ahead and open up O2B, or 2A, excuse me. We'll put it together. So the while wow loop has a very particular structure. Actually, a good thing about what we just did is because that writing of the data file is a custom node, and we changed it in one place, it changed it everywhere. So we've all inherited that new improved functionality. So here's the way the while well loop works. 
you're basically going to go through and do this. You're going to go through and basically pass values into this function. Okay, and that's the same function we've been working with just a few minutes ago. But here's how it actually works. Would you go through and the while loop starts out with an initial value, kind of sort of the first value you want to go through and test. And what it's going to do is every body of the loop, every time it goes through the loop, it's going to do something. Okay, in this case, what it's going to do is it's going to take our initial value and it's going to add the test value increment. So if the initial value is zero, the first time through it's going to say, oh, okay, I'm going to test two. And then what's happening is for the while, we're going to go through and test to return a value and ultimately say, is it greater than or equal to the target? Okay, so let me kind of see if that logic kind of makes sense. What you do is, again, you go through and you pass in the init value. The init value is zero. Here's what actually happens. You might notice this loop body has this kind of hole sitting around here next to the plus. What that hole is doing is every time it goes through the loop, think of it as passing, passing a token through and changing the value every time. So it starts at a zero, it goes through this function and adds two to it, so it's now two. It'll evaluate two, and based on that it'll come back up and the next time it'll be two plus two. So we get the four, and then it'll come back and get like that. So a little bit of looping. So how this all works, there's one new sort of chunk of code you need to sort of know about here. This is something called function compose. Function compose is something that'll go through and basically tie several different nodes together and just pass the value through. So it starts with a value of either zero or two, whatever it's the test value, it returns whatever it is. Okay. But then it takes that result and passes it down to here, the greater than or equal to, compared to the result to 1600, okay? Based on or whatever the target value is, okay? It's either true or false. That true or false actually gets returned as the while, so either true or false. And if it is still true, what will happen is it doesn't pass the 1600 back up or it doesn't pass the um, volume back up. What it passes back is the test value. So there's two things passing around right now. One is the test value, and one is the uh, result, and whether or not it's, yeah, you know, how it compares to the, uh, the testing value, or the stopping value. So let's just put this together and see if we can make this work. This function compose has the behavior of, it takes a series of different functions, and it just passes the result of one into the next one. Okay. So you can almost think of that as going through and <coughs> like uh, just putting together a bunch of different things into a custom node. Okay. It's interesting. After I, I did all this, I think we might even be able to just kind of connect those directly. But I'm going to keep the function composed into right now because it's sort of a more general purpose way. But Let's see if we get this to run, and then we'll sort of try to optimize it a little bit, see if we can make a change. So let us think about what's going on here. I still have to go through and browse for some file path. So let me go through, and I'll put it out on my desktop again using my new improve thing. I'm going to call it example 16.2c txt. Here, we'll see if we get this to run. So I'm starting at a value of zero. I'm incrementing by two. I'm going to keep on going until I get 1,600, okay? Or fail when I exceed 1,600. Let's see how that's looking. So I'm going to do a little run. Well, that's not very good looking in terms of what's going on there. Mm -hmm. Let me start it not at zero. Let me start it at two instead. It might just be complaining because it doesn't like the two or the zero. That's a little better looking. Interesting. Okay. It didn't go as far. Let's see if we can figure out what it's up to. Okay. It stopped at a gross volume of 1,800. 
I was asked to get the stop at a value of 1,600, so not just a little bit too far. Okay. Let's see if we can figure out what's going on. Even here, let's try that again. I'm going to go through, I'll say that I want it to stop at the value 2,000. Let me rerun that. <coughs> okay, and you'll see it stops at the value 2,200. Okay, so not too awfully bad. A little bit messy, but not too awfully bad. Let's see what happens over here. It's even going to go over here, and it returns a value. I think it returns the 2,200, and then it says it's false, and then it doesn't continue. Exactly. So, exactly. So, it's kind of weird, because you want it to stop beforehand, or you always want it to look ahead, but it doesn't. Okay, so it goes till it fails. Okay, so super. It's got the 2,200. It even tells us this thing over here, that is the value of the testing value when it failed. Do you have less than an equal to that? Is it less than? Well, that might actually work. Let's see. Let me put that one in instead. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. I'll take you over to here and take you over there. Okay, it's the new improved less than assumption. Okay, so what do we have that time? This time we actually got to 20,000 or 2,000. Okay. The reason this actually sort of works for you is because it actually is an even increment or something like that. It's, it's stopping on a whole one. So this will kind of work if it actually, what do I want to say? Let me try it. Let me try, uh, I'll vary it to see if I can kind of make this point. Uh, try making it 2100. Let's see what happens there. So with 2100, what does it come up to? It basically comes up to the 22. So the problem is, yeah, it's when it doesn't actually hit it perfectly, you sort of end up with that one. So not to worry. This is, yeah, an easy thing to fix. If you were going to go through and fix this behavior, let's think about what you could do. I'll put that one back over here. I did a less than or equal to. Okay. You know 22 failed. Okay. You know what the test value increment is. So it's actually pretty easy for you to figure out the last good value. All you really have to do is take the failing value and subtract the testing value. Mm -hmm. One instance of it, and you'll be OK. So let us try that. We'll say, let's go ahead and I'm going to oh, just make myself a little code block over here. I'm going to say the failing input value, and I'm going to subtract the uh, test increment value. So here's the failing value right here. Here's the test increment value over there. OK, so that should give me the last good one. Now, looking pretty good. What I would love to do now, though, I've computed it. Hey, great, it's going to be 20. That looks good. What I'd like to do is get that old box that's sitting back over there reduced to 20 so that it actually has the right value as opposed to being one over. So I don't know. Can you spot anywhere in this graph where we have a function where we might be able to feed in a value and actually set the value of the object to actually sort of go through and match it? And it's kind of just sitting there right in front of your face about the function you might use. We can take this value right in here, or this function, and say, hey, you are so, so handy. But as opposed to going through and list mapping through, or while looping through, what would happen if you actually did that? Okay, so 
if you do that and run it, at the end, it goes up, it gets one step further, then it jumps back. <laughs> So it just it stuck its toe over the line, got a little too far. So that's considered the last value of the value. Okay. And that's the basic principle of the whale loop right there. It's really just go through and go as far as you can and like uh, try and get to the point and then just back off to the point where you no longer are failing. Okay, so sort of makes sense? Excellent. Okay, so that is really the gist of using a whale loop. It's this whole thing, set up the testing node, loop well the condition's true, you're gonna fail at some point, then go back and set the element to the target value. Now, there's a couple of things still to kind of clean up about this example. Oh, for example, if you go back over to the file that we've been writing out and doing our snooping with, let's see where it is, right down there. Actually, there's a bunch of stuff in here because I've run it several times. You'll see it gets up to the failing value, then it comes over here, and then like it uh, backs off and gives you the final value in here. So if you really wanted a very clean looking Excel file or a very clean looking data, looking data file, we should probably find a way to say that, hey, this was the cleanup round as opposed to the testing round so that we can go back and knock off those last two. Okay. Or, we could just go through and uh, you know, take it at the tail end of the whole process and just knock out, it's really the last two rows. Yeah, either way, we just need some way of going through and kind of cleaning that up at the end. Okay, It's not actually very hard to do because what you can do with that whole thing is if we read it in as a CSV file, it'll give us all those different values and then we just knock out the last <coughs> two. So let's even sort of try that and see if we can kind of make that happen over here. Come back over here. You've set the value there. Okay, that's the results parameter value. I'm trying to think of the right way to do this. We want to do that, but after we do that, then we want to go through and do that. So I want to have a function. But I want to remove those two, but I want to wait for this very last value to come through here. So I need to create a function that's going to do this. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> I want the timing in there. I want the input in there. Can you can you condition the where you're storing the files to be like if it's higher than the max, you just don't store it. Then ah. That would be another way to do it. So, oh, I kind of like that. So let's think it over here. So basically, as you're writing out the file, so let's think about this. Back in this thing, I kind of like that as an approach. I have a number of ways I've tried to do this. Sometimes I set, an, I set a flag and say, you know, as opposed to writing this thing out, don't write it out the last time, or say remove it after the fact. But I kind of like where you're going better, because I think it's more generalizable. So let's see if we could figure this out. That basically, we're going to write the data file, okay? But we would say that basically, if the result value is greater, then don't write that instead. Okay, I kind of like that. So let's see if we can sort of go through and figure this out. So we know what the result parameter value is <coughs> here. And really, it's all this stuff. We don't really want to do all that stuff you know, if we uh, are already exceeding it. Okay. I like that. Let's see if we can figure this out. OK, so how about this? What if we put another input in over here? Okay, this is going to be my maximum result value. Let's kind of leave that hanging around over here. So here's the deal. If this number over here turns out to be greater than that value, 
Okay, then we don't want to write it out. So let's put a little if in there. How about, well, we'll see if we do this. We'll do a little uh, code block to kind of set that up. We'll say the computed result is greater than the maximum result desired. How about that? So we can say, let's go ahead and get that value. I put it in the wrong gun. Should be the computed result. Maximum result values over there. I even change that to desired. You can be very clear about this. Looking good. I got that. I got that. Hey, I got a true false at this point, so let's go back and see if we can use an if to go through and control this. And I've had mixed luck with some of my ifs, but we'll see if we can make the logic work. So if that is true, what do we want to do? If it is true, And I actually, in terms of this, what do I want to do? I want to basically pass out not a whole lot of anything. If it's true, if it's false, add the data row there. But if it's empty, it's empty there. How about this? It's this whole notion of the data value to add. The problem is we're going to mess with the file right here. So let's go through <coughs> this. How about if it's true, we're going to send through an empty list. If it's false, we're going to go through and kind of set in this new row. So if it's false, I'll send in the empty row. If it's true, I'm just going to send in an empty list. I can send in a specific value in there. I want to send in there. Send in null. I'm going to send in an empty list, though. I think that might be good. So I'm going to evaluate you. I'm either going to send in the real list or the empty list. I'm going to go through and send that in as the data value to add. My problem is it's hard to sort of stop it from going down that whole branch. So I almost have to send something down the branch that is, because uh, it's going to write something to the file. It's, even in the false, it will still try to write something to the file. OK, but I think you're on to sort of a good approach to this. So let's come back over here and say, if the data value to add was empty, somehow not do anything there. So come back over here. So let's see what's going on over here. We have the CSV file path. We read from the file path. That's all fine. But we don't want to do that. Data list to add, if that is empty. Otherwise, we just pass it on through. So if it's empty, what do we want to do? We don't want to join it. OK, this actually makes sense. And then it's going to come back over here. CSV read from the file. Where does it write from the file? It writes from the file back out here, right? Yep, OK. So. Um, apologize is getting sort of messy. Basically, if this thing is empty over here, what we want to do is just bypass the list join. Okay, so let's say um, is empty. So I have my list to add. I'll see if it's empty. And then we'll put an if in here. If this works, Caesar, you're going to be a hero. If it doesn't, you can say, 
Nice idea, but <laughs> <laughs> so we'll test if it's empty. If it is true that it is empty, then really what I'm going to do is basically just pass the CSV file okay, right back out to the output list. So if you're empty, okay, don't do anything more. Just take the CSV file you just read and pass you right back out. If it's false that you're empty, then go through, read the file, do the list join to the file, and then we'll take the list joined and I'll put that instead. So it's a really twisted, contorted sort of logic. And if you have any other sort of programming skill, you feel like, ah, that was a really ugly way to do that. But I think that's the best way to do that in Dino. OK. Almost sort of makes sense. I'll go ahead and save this out after we get done. Up. Yeah. Let's try running this, and based on how it runs, we'll take a break. So hang on here. OK, so I got all that. Let me save this away. <coughs> Let me come back over here. I'll save that one away. Let's come back over here and give it a test. OK, any bets? Anyone a betting person? A little run completed. That didn't seem to do much of anything. I'm going to try this again, change something around a little bit. not good. We better plug that up. Let's try that. Did something. Let's see. So we were going for 2100. It stopped at a nearby value of 2200, but it didn't kind of keep on going. Let's see how we're doing on our CSV file. It knows the 22 is too far. Oh, I think we just have to go ahead and plug this guy down here, too. Yeah, because I didn't get the 2000. Check that out. Let's try that. Up, oh, okay, hitch back. That looked good. Okay, let's go back and see if our CSV file looks good. Down to 20. No, it's still not there. Hmm. Come back over here, see if we can see anything in our, all our watch action. Hetero, that's all okay there. The last time through, although it's a little hard to see because the last time through, it did fix it. It did run it out there that other time. Hmm. That last second to last time, it should have come through as a list empty, but we never were quite sure. Yeah, so let's just break it down already. But again, we won't belabor that right now. Ah, no, data list to add empty list. If list empty. So it did come through as empty list that last time. True. Ah, we'll find that error in that. But again, let's not belabor that right now. That's some messing around on my side. I'll go ahead and figure that out. That won't dissuade us. Let's go ahead and take our break now. When you come on back, we're going to apply that to a slightly more interesting structure and think about another way to search too. So let's go ahead and break and come on back in five. <coughs>